you and for that introduction. And I'm very grateful um, to be um, and um, delighted to be here this morning um, to have the opportunity to perhaps have a step back and have a look at that cathedral that we're building um, and, um, and take an opportunity to think just at the beginning of this conference um, at um, how important that is and what might be some of the factors that are particularly relevant for the people that we serve, our consumers, um, our citizens, and, um, and for uh, businesses. Um, and as we think about how together we can create products that are, that are really sustainable. So we have um, operations in 100 countries and sales in 190. About half our sales are in developing and emerging markets. And our products are used 2 billion times a day. And that, for me, is a reminder that for um, all of us uh, working in business, the scale of what we do um, has positive impacts, but also negative ones. Um, we're best known for our brands, um, and um, here, are, here are some of them here. Um, and and, uh, and it's, it's those brands that in the end are going to carry the story through to consumers. Three or four years ago, we set out our vision for our company, which was to double the size of our business whilst reducing our environmental footprint and increasing our positive social impact. Um, and we've described the way that we want to achieve that combination of driving business growth together with um, uh, um, uh, decoupling our growth from our environmental footprint um, in the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. Um, and I'm here today first because um, as uh, Unilever has been a member of the Sustainability Council from its foundation, um, and we're also actively involved in the EU product environmental footprinting work um, and specifically working in the AISE group on laundry detergents and in a shadow group um, on shampoos. So um, I really want to look today at the opportunities we have for uh, uh, alignment and for collaboration um, and, um, and think a bit about what some of the positive outcomes can be um, of working together. So you know um, very well that we're still, as a world, we're facing huge challenges. 800 million people in the world don't have access to safe drinking water. Two billion um, don't have access to a toilet. We see climate change accelerating towards two degrees. About a billion people living today in water-scarce areas, and that will increase over time. A billion people going to bed hungry every night, while a billion um, are obese. Um, and an increasing demand for food as the population rises. So that, as we know, is the bigger um, challenge that we all face, the big social, environmental, and economic um, issues that, the, that uh, we all face together. And of course, behind that, we're consuming natural resources faster than we can replenish them. Um, and what's the business case for this? So um, the way um, we have described it, and which I find quite helpful, is we have a, an approach um, to how we grow our business, which we call the virtuous circle of growth. Um, and when it comes to sustainability, we, I've asked the question, well, how can we accelerate that virtuous circle? Um, and I think there are some very tangible ways in which this, um, uh, designing, um, uh, uh, and appro uh, designing products brands um, and uh, reshaping your operations can really drive business. First of all, of course, by reducing costs. Less energy use, less raw material use um, drive, um, will reduce costs and, and create efficiencies. Um, similarly, with addressing risks, the risk of the, in the food su supply chain of price volatility um, or lack of availability of raw materials um, is going to become an increasing issue as, as populations increase, as GDP increases. Um, and um, um, and, it will, and um, the challenges of a changing climate will affect crops. So the more we can do to reduce costs, increase efficiency, and address risks, the more we can then invest back into innovation, innovation that works across the value chain, um, both right through from raw material sourcing down to how consumers use and dispose of our products. And of course, if you work across the value chain, that means that we need to collaborate because at that, when you look at the value chain, there are always many actors involved. Um, and so one of, I think one of the uh, great uh, dynamics, if you like, for um, fresh business growth is actually finding those new collaborations, which is a mark of 21st century um, success. Um, and sustainable innovation and collaboration should lead to higher growth um, and um, fuel, um, fuel brands and 
uh, what we all see, I think, is that um, a higher purpose is very inspiring for employees of companies um, and creates a, a, a new motivation. But what about consumers? I think here today we're all thinking about how we can shape products to be more sustainable. And the way that um, we buy and use products is a critical part um, of, of success. Now, the prevailing paradigm, the, tradi the, the traditional kind of insight on consumers, um, which uh, um, uh, is, is, uh, has been sort of central, I think, to um, environmental product design, is that consumers are not prepared to make the trade-off. So I want it at the same price, the same quality, the same convenience, and then I might also choose um, a, a product which is sustainably sourced or responsibly grown um, or, or greener, the greener option. Even though there might be some benefits, but uh, they, don't, they won't outweigh um, some of the, the, uh, the negatives. I, I think we're at a tipping point. I'm, I'm beginning to see consumer research which is um, suggesting that this, is, that this attitude is changing. And I believe that was, has been the consumer mindset of the last 20 years or more. Um, but I believe we're seeing signs of change. One of those signs of change is because of some of the shocks that are happening in the system. So whether that's the horse meat scandal here in Europe or the melanin in milk scare in China, consumers are reacting. They want to know more. Um, this is a quote from our own research um, uh, uh, from a, cons a consumer in Germany who said, I'll never eat ready meal lasagna again because of the horse meat. I would eat horse meat, but not when it's been sneaked in. Uh, and I think that tells you something about how important it is for people to know, they want to know more about where my, uh, where my ingredients are from, particularly in food, how they're made, what's in it. Um, the, 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 um, the other photo, uh, picture here is from a Hong Kong supermarket, uh, which after the melanin scare started to label the foreign brands um, with flags um, in order to give their consumers more uh, sense of a sense of security and transparency. We've also done some research um, in our own company um, in 11 different countries all around the world, Europe, um, uh, Asia, and America, um, about 5,000 um, or so consumers that we researched. And we look particularly um, at this question around food. And what we're seeing is, a, is a real signals in terms of the expectations changing. So um, uh, over 80% of people saying that they believe it's important to treat our farmland in a way which future generations can still farm on. That they believe that, it's that they're more likely to buy products made from sustainably sourced ingredients. Um, and that they see a connection between that sustainable sourcing and higher quality. But two thirds say they can't identify the sustainability credentials of the, of the food products when they're shopping. So there's, there's a, a desire that they're articulating. But I think many of you will be asking the question in the room, OK, so we've heard some of this before, there, there's a, but there's a big gap between intention of consumers and what they say they'd like and action. Um, here's a new report that's come from the Boston Consulting Group. Um, and they have done a fascinating study where they have taken actual behavior. So the barcode um, scanned sales from US retail outlets in home, personal care, and foods. And what they have found is that products that are labeled organic, natural, ecological, and fair trade, which were traditionally niche, considered more expensive, lower quality, less convenient, tasted less good, worked less well, they're no longer niche. They're finding they've become mainstream. There's a broad base of consumers who are now buying these products, but typically, they're not, by, they're not coming from the, uh, the leading brands. What we are seeing is some very um, strong growth. So growth of 9% over the last three years across those three sectors, which is 70% of the total growth of those sectors um, and 15% of all sales. I think it's one of those blind spots that um, certainly I would say I haven't seen um, in, in, um, in, um, in my work looking at, at consumers um, and consumer trends. Um, and that is now shifting quite rapidly. A BCG have also done work in um, Europe, um, which suggests to them that we can see it, we'll see a similar trend um, in Europe as well. So um, a real shift, I think, and I, I'm, hope, I'm optimistic that there's a shift here from the stated intentions over to real actions in the marketplace. 
Um, but what we are, what we do know, um, is that she's still a bit confused. You know, how do I work out what to buy? Um, and that's where we come in. Um, and the question we need to ask is, how do we help her? How do we help her to choose, um, to use, um, to throw away more sustainably? And for me, that's, in the end, exactly what the EU product environmental footprint work and the work of the Sustainability Consortium are jointly seeking to achieve. To set a shared objective to drive action to improve the sustainability of consumer products. And to do so in a way which engages many stakeholders in a really collaborative process. Uh, a process that results in some practical tools. And those tools will advance the science will advance the implementation and the action and advance the communication, whether that's business to business or consumer to consumer, or business to consumer. So a really shared goal that I think we can start um, this summit with, um, and looking side by side at the programs, um, there's such enormous similarity between them both, both focusing on environmental impacts, sustain the sustainability consortium, also looking at how to incorporate social impacts. The EU PEF um, work obviously focusing on Europe as a starting point, but, but recognising, of course, that we have global supply chains um, in scope. Both got business to business in mind. Sustainability consortium more focused now on the business to, uh, um, on business to business and the, the um, PEF uh, business to consumer as well. And both with the underpinning of a, a life cycle approach, um, whether that's with the LCA methodology or taking that through to hotspots in, in product categories. And practical outcomes, on pack labeling, communication, <laughs> policies, taxes, incentives, toolkits, um, uh, and a partnership with SAP from the Sustainability Consortium to um, make it easy for businesses to efficiently um, provide their, the information online um, and access the, the knowledge which will help to shape uh, product sustainability. So some very um, shared themes with perhaps some spins on the edges is how I would think of it. Um, the Consumer Goods Forum is also very aligned behind th this goal. It shares the common goal of driving sustainability through um, products. Um, the Consumer Goods Forum is a global um, association of around 400 retailers um, and consumer goods um, suppliers and manufacturers. Um, and Unilever co-chairs the uh, Sustainability Working Group together with Marks & Spencer, the UK retailer. Um, and in the area of um, uh, creating product solutions um, and, um, and standardised um, measurement, what the CGF is really looking for is Please make it global, harmonized, let's have some consistent definitions. It needs to be simple um, and straightforward um, for companies to use, that we need to find an efficient way of making it work for large companies through to small and medium-sized um, enterprises. And of course, the end game um, is to drive action and progress. And so everything needs to be oriented really towards usability in the end. Um, so there's lots of scope, I think, for alignment and harmonization, and the Sustainability Consortium, um, I see as, 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 as um, very much when it comes um, contributing, learning from, and collaborating with the EU uh, PEF um, to, cre to create that uh, uh, opportunity for a, a alignment together, um, participating in some of the uh, pilots, um, a commitment to incorporate the published studies um, using the PEF methodology into um, the, the appropriate TSC uh, product category tools. Um, and that practice is something that TSC is already doing. Um, so adopting the um, scientifically based approaches um, that, um, of, um, of, of groups such as the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, the CDP, and the Consumer Goods Forum's approach on deforestation and their global packaging products project. So just some examples, I suppose, of the ways in which um, uh, uh, in, uh, the, the kind of bringing together and harmonization is very possible in a practical and tangible way. Um, and of course, um, critical to all of this is ongoing dialogue between the two organizations or two programs. So I want to take a step back now and say, okay, so let's imagine the world where we understand 
um, environmental impacts, um, and they help us to take action. Well, we don't need to imagine that world. It's already here, isn't it? Many of uh, uh, you here in the audience are already taking action. Um, and um, I wanted to give a few examples. They are mainly Unilever examples because they're the ones I know. Um, but um, I, uh, I hope that will just be the start of, 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 of many others. This first one is from um, AISE, so the um, voluntary industry action which this, the um, European Household Goods um, uh, Association um, has uh, created has been really quite astounding, I think. First of all, because it has a track record that has gone over many years. And if you look here at the um, highlights from their latest um, round of reporting, um, you'll see that, the, um, that there's some very strong progress. For example, energy consumption, CO2 emissions down by um, 10%. Um, and um, just in the last year, um, and changes over since 2006 of almost 30%. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the um, sustainability charters advanced sustainability profiles, now almost a third of laundry detergent products in Europe um, comply with that, um, with that profile. Um, and, an, uh, and an increase just in that, that last 12 months of, of almost 20% um, of, of uh, consumer products which are carrying the um, uh, um, advanced sustainability profile logo. So re um, th I think this is a wonderful example of uh, a proper look across the value chain and an, uh, an approach to how do we take action together um, and um, in our companies then take, um, taking, the, um, taking the appropriate action on, on, on products um, that will drive change and being able to track and report that. A um, few examples here of, where, of the different ways in which I think that um, research and technology um, and, um, and, and management approaches can drive change. Um, and I think some of these approaches, um, and this is an example, um, drives change which is invisible to the consumer. Probably we'll never talk about it. So this is a, um, a new piece of packaging technology. Uh, Unilever has... Um, partnered with, um, two, uh, with two other companies, Alpla and Mucell, um, and designed um, a kind of plastic which injects bubbles into the plastic, reducing the wall thickness, as you can see from that picture there. Uh, we've launched it on um, Dove, um, and uh, it reduces the plastic um, in that bottle by 15%. It's still 100% recyclable as before, um, and we estimate that once we've rolled it out across our portfolio that we'll see savings of up to 50 million euros just from that one piece of technology. We won't talk to consumers about it, it's really invisible. Um, and this technology is going to be um, uh, available for um, all companies to use uh, from the beginning of next year. So a real opportunity for, um, uh, to, to create a scalable and multi multiplier effect. Um, this um, example is very visible to consumers. So this is our, our compressed deodorants, which we launched in the UK last year um, and, and launched in France and Germany um, this year. Um, and essentially, um, it's about the packaging is about half the size. We use half the um, propellant inside. And so it cut, cuts CO2 by about 25% versus the original. And despite the fact that there are still um, large packs for sale um, on the shelf, the standard size packs are for sale on the shelf, we've seen a very rapid conversion rate by consumers. 40% um, switched um, to the compressed deodorant within the female, the women's deodorant sector, which was the first area where we launched. Um, during a quite rapid period, we were surprised actually by the conversion. And I think the heart of it is that we spent a lot of time thinking about how to make it really simple for the consumer so she didn't have to change any of her unconscious habits. And this for me is one of the big advantages of, um, uh, of, uh, that companies can have by doing what we do best, which is brilliant consumer insight combined with um, great research um, and, and innovation capabilities. Um, how else do we trigger that purchase decision? Because the, the compressed deodorant is really about triggering that purchase decision. Um, and of course, um, many of you, um, if you're a foods or beverage company, will have partnered with Rainforest Alliance or Fair Trade, LEAF, or other certification bodies to, um, to work on 
how to make the, um, the ingredients that you source more sustainable. It's a benefit for our supply chains, it's a benefit for the farmers, um, and it's a, it's a win for consumers as well, because what they see is that, um, hmm, okay, so you source this sustainably, so you must have selected more carefully, and the quality will be higher. Um, and I'm seeing this time and time again, um, that consumers are seeing a genuine benefit for, for them, um, as well as for the world in this approach. But just like with the packaging example, uh, the bubble packaging, um, there are times when we are going to need to take action, which is not necessarily going to grow, uh, not necessarily going to grow um, our brands um, and is not necessarily going to be relevant for consumers to hear about. Um, the approach to um, eliminating deforestation in palm, soy, paper and beef is one. Um, another that we've embarked on recently is looking at tea. Unilever happens to be the, the number one tea company in the world if uh, Lipton is um, the world's largest brand. So tea is really important to us. Um, and what we're seeing is that climate change is affecting the, um, uh, the resilience of tea crops. Um, so we've partnered with a, a company called Nature Source Genetics to look at what are the uh, natural tea varieties that are out there that are best, best able to cope with a changing climate and can withstand, therefore, drought, disease, pests, um, uncertain rainfall. Um, probably this is something that um, we won't share with consumers, but which will undoubtedly create that resilience um, of, um, and for the future um, of, the, of the tea market. So just a few examples of how, in very tangible ways, an understanding of where the impacts are across the value chain from sourcing through to use and disposal um, can make a difference. But also, I think how um, important it is to take this challenge of, of looking, of, 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 uh, um, for each of us um, uh, working in a, in a business, to think about how to utilize our R&D um, and management resources to their best abilities to come up with inventive and innovative solutions. Um, and so finally, I want to just think uh, briefly about some of the challenges and then the opportunities um, that we have in front of us um, as we look forward in, uh, to working together in this summit and beyond. So I, I think that for all of us that, you know, we know what the big challenges are, we can see the big picture, the cathedral where we, where we want to go, um, but we do need to get down into the details um, uh, in order to be successful. And getting down into the details can in itself have its own challenges. How, how far do we go? How, how far do we go in terms of specificity of our understanding um, uh, uh, versus the, the cost that it might be that, uh, that, that of, of um, uh, getting the data um, and, um, and analyzing it and working on it would take? And there's somewhere there's a balance there. Um, and certainly I experience in my own role um, that that's something that, that we're constantly thinking about is, um, is, is where to make that, uh, wh where, uh, how far to go. The second, um, which we all face, is, the, is uh, we, we need to consider the availability of data and the, um, if you like, the answerability of, of the, the questions um, that um, doing footprinting requires needs to be something that will work whether you have a a large research department or whether you're a very small company. Um, if it doesn't work for small and medium-sized enterprises, then I, I think we don't have a, sufficient, uh, a sufficiently successful solution. And of course, then there's the unknown factor of how ready consumers are to change their purchasing behavior and the way they use products um, and services. Um, that's, uh, um, that, you, you know, I, I have uh, expressed an optimistic view that the consumer is shifting um, but there's no doubt that to make real habit change, you have to think well beyond information. You need to ha we need to have a, if you like, a holistic view of how the design of products um, can really help <coughs> to, to um, catalyze that change. Um, and so finally, the opportunity. Well, clearly we have a huge opportunity. If we're working across that value chain, then collaboration is crucial. Um, and there are many areas which are um, open to us to work on in partnership and to co-create those solutions for the, the, the better common purpose that we have. And I think we can get really practical and tangible today. I, there are four workshops, construction and electronics, chemical sector, 
packaging and packed water, all of which provide an opportunity just um, uh, um, uh, to, to really start thinking um, about the, the way in which we can um, create that uh, um, practical alignment um, that, I sh that we all believe is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you.